am going to present a joint work with uh, Claudio Calosi. Actually, it's a pity Claudio is not here. I would love to just sit and listen to Claudio talking. Uh, instead, I have to give a talk. Um, so, I'm going to present the content of the paper, which is uh, currently kidnapped at the journal. Uh, was not accepted it after some uh, six acceptances from reviewers. Uh, hopefully, this will be the last round. Uh, the main question of this talk is going to be is it possible for something to be at more than one place? To be, to put my title here and there. Now, you might think, well, of course it is, right? For example, myself being an extended being and, in a sense, here, but also there, right? So there is a sense of location in which uh, anything that is extended is at more than one place. But, of course, we are not going, going to discuss about uh, such trivial cases. More precisely, our question is going to be, is it possible for something not to be partly here and partly there, but rather, whether it is possible for one thing to be exactly at one place, not partly, exactly at one place, and exactly also at another place. Um, such cases are usually called in the literature cases of multilocation. So our question is whether multilocation is possible. On the one hand, one has to realize that many metaphysical theories are de facto committed to the possibility of multilocation. I'll give a couple of examples. The first example, immanent universes. Now, if you believe in the existence of universes and you believe them to be immanent, then you believe them to be in space and time. Right? And usually, you believe them to be exactly located wherever they are exemplified. So, if something exemplifies redness and is located here, also redness itself, the universal, is going to be exactly located there. Now, if you believe in immanent universes, then you see, or immanent universes of this kind in particular, you uh, are committed, of course, uh, to the possibility of multilocation. Suppose that there is a red chair there, this means that redness itself is exactly located at the region of the chair. But redness, of course, as a universal, can be exemplified by other things, such as a red table. And uh, given that you believe in immanent universes, you are also going to believe that redness is exactly located at the region of the table. So redness is going to be multi-located. A second example of a theory a popular theory which is committed to the possibility of multilocation is the so-called three-dimensionalist theory of persistence. Now, of course, the question of persistence is roughly how is it possible for an object to persist through time or through space-time, if you believe in such things. Um, and of course, especially if you believe in space-time, there is a view which suggests itself, which is called four-dimensionalism. According to four-dimensionalism, a persisting object is a four-dimensional object, extended in the three dimensions of space, but also in the dimension of time, which is therefore four-dimensional, and is exactly located at one region, one space-time region, the four-dimensional space-time region that the object occupies. So you see the four-dimensional object being exactly located at the four-dimensional region of space-time that it occupies throughout its spatial-temporal area. Now, four-dimensionalism is a popular theory, indeed, but it also has some consequences that some people do not accept or are not willing to accept. For example, once again, the fact that according to four-dimensionalism, we are extended through time. We certainly believe to be extended through space, but are we also extended through time in the same way as four-dimensionalism suggests? Also, if you believe in four-dimensionalism, 
you're gonna probably believe that you divide into so-called temporal paths. So, if you are a four-dimensionalist, you probably believe that what you have in front of you, namely myself, is not really a full human being, it is rather a part of that human being, namely a slice of this four-dimensional entity. And some people believe that this is crazy. Of course, what you have in front of you is a full human being. So far, dimensionalism has to be rejected. And this is why some people are three-dimensionalists. They believe objects to be three-dimensional entities extended at most in three dimensions. The question then becomes, of course, how is it possible for a three-dimensional entity, an entity that is extended in three dimensions, to cover a four-dimensional uh, spatial temporal region, right? The spatial temporal region of its persistence. And the usual standard um, answer nowadays, an answer that Peter and myself uh, don't share, but still a standard answer, is that this three-dimensional entity is going to cover this four-dimensional region by being multi-located, by being exactly located at each instant composing that uh, region. Okay? So you see why three-dimensionalism seems to be committed to the possibility of multilocation. So, on the one hand, once again, many metaphysical theories seem to be committed to the possibility of multilocation. And yet, clearly enough, multilocation is problematic and is controversial. There are many arguments that have been given against the possibility of multilocation. The one we will be working on today is the problem that Claudia and I uh, call the multilocation trilemma. So, in order to understand the problem and also to have a better grasp of what multilocation is supposed to be, we should first talk a little bit about the notion of location itself. Now, in this context, location is supposed to be a binary relation between an entity, the located entity, on the one end, and a region of a dimension on the other. The, the dimension being space, time, space-time, or any other dimension. Now, the first thing to realize in this context is, in fact, a thing that, uh, a thing that we have hinted to before. Location, as it appears in natural language, is an ambiguous notion. By saying that something is located somewhere, we might mean different things. And in particular, we should distinguish two notions. First, there is the notion of exact location. Okay? Roughly, the notion has been characterized in the past as uh, signifying the relation between myself and the region, say, of space that is exactly the same boundaries that I have, okay, corresponding to my boundaries. Um, nowadays, a more popular gloss on exact location goes like this. If X is exactly located at the region R, then X and R, the located entity and the region, share shape, size, and are equidistant with respect, uh, with respect to anything else. Okay? This is one way of capturing intuitively what exact location is supposed to be. Exact location, on the one hand, should be contrasted with other notions of location, most notably weak location. Now, intuitively, X is weakly located at the region R, just in case R is not completely free of X. Okay? This is a common sense in which we say things to be located at places. For example, I am located in this room, not in the sense of exact location, right? We don't share our boundaries, but certainly enough in the sense of weak location, because this room is not completely free of me. And this is also going to be the case even if I reach, say, an arm <coughs> outside of this room, or even if I only reach an arm inside of this room. Okay? 
In all those cases, this room is going to be um, a weak location. So here, once again, is a presentation um, of uh, location. Um, you see the round entity, the gray entity X, and some regions. You notice that X in this picture only has one exact location. The round region are one. Okay, it is the only one that has the same shape, size, and equidistance with respect to anything else with X. Uh, but also has several weak locations, several regions that are not completely free of X, <coughs> such as R3, which is not completely free of it, R5, also R2, of course, is not completely free, and also R1 is not completely free of it. So all of them are weak locations. Of course, there is also a region here represented that is neither an exact location nor a weak location of X, namely R4. Okay? Good. So, um, we have two notions of location. Okay? Being them in the same semantic area, this is an important point, being them in the same semantic area, we would expect them to be interdefinable, right? We would expect them to be possibly defined one in terms of the other, right? And how is it possible to define one in terms of the other? Actually, there are several attempts. Um, one obvious attempt is to define exact location, sorry, weak location, in terms of exact location. Okay. Now, take any example of a weak location of X. Okay? Take, for example, R3. What does it mean, or what it might mean, for X to be weakly located at R3? Well, you might notice that actually R3 overlaps, has a part in common with the exact location of X, with R1. Okay? So, and in fact, this, is, this holds for any weak location of X that we see here. So it seems that any weak location of X shares a part with the exact location of X. We can exploit this intuition to actually frame a definition of weak location in terms of exact location. What is for something to be weakly located at the region? Well, there must be an exact location for that entity and R must overlap that exact location. Okay? Good. Uh, so this is a classical definition of weak location in terms of exact location. Still, this de defini uh, definition has famously some problems. Maybe the most well-known and more easily, uh, easily understandable problem with this definition is that this definition implies a principle called exactness. What is exactness? Well, exactness is a principle that tells you that anything that is somewhere, anything that has a weak location, is also going to have an exact location. Right? Because if something has a weak location, then by definition there must be an exact location for that thing. And exactness is indeed a controversial principle. There are several counterexamples to exactness, just to mention one. Quantum mechanics, under some interpretations, seems to imply that the, the possibility that particles have an indeterminate position. Particles are not going not to be in space. Of course, particles are going to be in space somewhere but nowhere precisely. So they are not going to have an exact location. Um, okay, and let me notice. By quoting quantum mechanics, by using quantum mechanics, I have, I think, satisfied one of the two necessary conditions for a talk to be a talk given partly, at least, by Claudio. <laughs> Towards the end, we'll see that the second necessary condition is satisfied as well. Okay, 
So we've seen that there is a problem in defining weak location in terms of exact location. What about the other way around? What about defining exact location in terms of weak location? Is that possible? Well, there is a famous attempt by Josh Parsons, which goes roughly like this. X is exactly located at R if and only if for every region, if that region overlaps with the exact location, it is a weak location of X, and vice versa. We don't really have time to enter into details uh, of uh, uh, why this counts as a plausible definition of exact location. Maybe some of you already have seen why. Uh, because what is important here is that also this definition has consequences, of course, as any definition has. In particular, this definition implies a principle called functionality. According to functionality, nothing can have more than one exact location. Or, in other terms, multi-location is impossible. Right? Um, good. So, of course, this is bad news for multilocation. Either we have just shown that multilocation is impossible, or the, the friend of multilocation comes up with, with another possibility. Right? And, uh, good. So, roughly to sum up temporarily what we have seen, if we define weak location in terms of exact location, exact as follows, which is bad. If we define exact location in terms of weak location, functionality follows, and multi-location is impossible. Right? So I'm defining one in terms of the other, or the other in terms of the first one, seems to give problematic consequences for the friend of multi-location. Well, here is a third possibility. Maybe what we have just shown is that we cannot define one term in terms of the other, one notion in terms of the other. Maybe what we have just shown is that we should give up in trying to define one notion in terms of the other. Maybe we should accept both notions as primitive. Good. Yet, this is not so easy either. Why? Well, here is a possible example of a problem that this strategy um, will imply. The problem is that some plausible principles concerning location are going to become brute necessities. So, brute necessities meaning that they are necessities which have no explanation. I give you one example. Consider the principle called weakness. According to weakness, if something has an exact location, that thing is also going to have a weak location. Right? This seems really to be an uncontroversial principle. Right? Take, for example, myself. If I have an exact location, then there is a region which is not completely free of myself, at least my exact location. Right? So this seems to be a completely uncontroversial principle of location. Okay? Now, this principle, weakness, was actually a theorem if you accepted one of the two definitions that we have presented before. Uh, for example, take the definition of weak location in terms of exact location. Now, if something is exactly located somewhere, you just need to find a region which overlaps with that region, with your exact location, in order for uh, you, yourself, to have a weak location. So, given that any region overlaps with itself, you immediately have that um, if you have an exact location, you also have a weak location. So, weakness is a theory of this definition, and also of the other definition by Parsons. So, if you accept one of the other definitions that we have presented, so, if you say that you don't have two primitives, but one is defined in terms of the other, weakness is a necessity that follows from the definitions of the notions that we have given. 
On the other hand, if you accept both weak and exact location as primitives, you have no explanation for this necessity. So this is going to be a brute necessity. If you don't like brute necessities, then you have a problem, of course. Basically, you see, we, have, um, we went through three possibilities, and all of them seem to be problematic to some extent, or at least for some people. And this is why we call this problem the multi-location triangle. Now, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about one possible way out. Uh, the possible way out is due to Anthony Ego, who in a couple of papers have presented a possible solution to this problem. So, the strategy basically is to define an exact location in terms of weak location in a way which does not imply functionality. Okay? How to define exact location in terms of weak location without implying functionality? Well, Ego introduces two notions to begin with. The first one is containment, the other one is filling. So, I'm not going to be too much formal here so that everyone can follow. Uh, hopefully, this will not create problems. So, basically, what is for something to be contained in a region? Well, Eagle says X is contained in a region if and only if each part of X is weakly located at the sub region of R. Okay? Each part of X is weakly located at the sub region of R. Consider again this case. An example of region in which X is contained is R5. Why? Because every part of X is weakly located at some sub-region of R5. Or in other terms, no part of X is weakly located outside R5. And then you have filling. X fills R if and only if X is weakly located at each sub-region of R. Okay? So, you take, say, R2 is a region which X feeds. Why? Well, because uh, um, X, you take any sub-region of R2, X is going to be weakly located there. So, that region is not going to be completely free of it. Okay? So, you might notice that in giving these two notions, Eagle is somehow mixing the Mariology of the located entity and the Mariology of the regions where things are located. Unlikely the other definitions that we have seen. Okay? So, this is another strategy, it's a slightly different strategy. Armed with these two notions, Eagle defines finally exact location. So, what is it for something to be exactly located at the region? Ego says that X is exactly located at the region if and only if X is contained in, a, in R, but X also fills R. Okay? So, it's the limit case of the, two, of the two motions. And also, this is quite important, he has a clause, he says, no proper sub-region of R contains and is filled by X. This clause is important, we don't have time uh, to enter into the reasons, reasons why um, he wants to add it. Uh, maybe in the Q&A we can go back to this, this point. In any case, an exact location is a region uh, that contains uh, X, that is filled by X and such that no proper sub-region of R contains and is filled by X. Okay? So once again, you see that say R1 contains X and is filled by X and there is no proper sub-region of R1 which contains uh, and is filled by X. In particular, there is no sub-region of R1 that contains X. Okay? Good. Um, so, and this, this definition 
does not formally speaking imply functionality. So it seems to allow for multilocation. For a case like this one, in which you have one single entity, Circo, which is exactly located at two regions, R1 and R2. Okay? Good. So in our paper, basically, we argue that Eagle's definition is unsuccessful. Not because, in fact, it does imply functionality, but rather because if it allows for multiplication in the letter without implying functionality, it does not allow for multiplication in the spirit, in the sense that it undercuts all possible motivations or serious possible motivations to believe in the actuality of multiplication, as we can see. In fact, in the paper, I think we present some five cases here. I'm only going to present the three most uh, easy cases and most obvious cases. The first one is that Eagle's definition makes what we call nested multilocation impossible. What is nested multilocation? Well, it is a case in which something has an exact location, but is also exact lo exactly located at a smaller region which is contained in the first exact location. Okay? That is why it is called nested multilocation. Now, it should be obvious uh, why Eagle's definition makes nested multilocation impossible. Right? Because in order for R to be an exact location of X, no proper subregion of R contains any field by X. So it is impossible for any proper subregion of X to be an exact location. Right? Because in order to be an exact location, that region must contain and be field. Is that clear or not? So, Eagle's definition makes nested multilocation impossible. However, cases of nested multilocation are ubiquitous, at least in the case of immanent universes, if you think about it. Why? Well, once again, consider the case of Agnes and the child. Okay? We said that universes are exactly located wherever they are exemplified, or in other terms, wherever something that exemplifies them is exactly located. Okay. Now, this means that redness is exactly located at the region of the chair, given that the chair exemplifies redness. But now consider a part of the chair. Say, this leg. This leg is also red. It exemplifies redness. And therefore, redness is also exactly located at this region. So if you believe in immanent universes of this kind, you're going to believe in nested multilocation. Okay? So you see how, therefore, Eagle's definition undercuts one of the main motivations to take multilocation seriously. Um, you might think, well, okay, this problem concerns universes. But maybe Eagle's definition works well, at least in the case of objects. <laughs> not so, we argue. In particular, not so if those objects are meriologically complex. Okay? Good. So, in order to see why, consider again the case of the multilocated circle. Okay? Now, of course, the multilocated circle, being meteorologically complex, has paths. Okay? In particular, we might distinguish a half part, uh, pardon, a left part and a right part. Okay? So, you have the circle, you have the left part, which we call lefty, you have the right part, which we call righty. Okay? And consider the exact locations of those parts, okay? R1 left is the exact location of lefty, R1 right is the exact location of righty. Okay? Good. Now, circle is supposed to have 
only two exact locations, namely this round region and this round region. However, <laughs> given correct, <laughs> given Ego's definition, it is going to have more than two, actually many more than two, possibly, well, depending on the number of parts and counting them. Um, so, what is the problem once again? Well, consider, for example, the left part of circle here and its exact location, and the right part of circle and its exact location here. Okay? Consider these two disconnected regions. Okay? Now, consider now the meteorological sum of those connected, disconnected regions, okay? So the complex region, which is composed by this semicircle and this semicircle, okay? According to Ego's definition, this complex region, the virological sum, is going to be an exact location of uh, um, circle itself. Why? Because it contains circle, and is filled by circle. Okay? So once again, go back to the definition in case uh, you don't see it. I don't have time to enter into details. Okay, so basically, what you see here is that whenever the multilocated entity is meteorologically complex, Eagle's definition delivers massively wrong judgments of exact location. Right? Because it tells you that the entity is not, say, the true, the true, uh, sorry, the one uh, multilocated uh, circle is not only exactly located to the true circular regions, but it's actually exactly located also at other regions. Okay. Well, well, you might say, well, maybe Eagle's definition doesn't work in the case of meteorologically complex objects. But maybe it works in the case of meteorologically simple objects. So objects that don't have parts. Not so, we argue. At least not in the case of simple objects that are also extended. Okay? In particular, of course, we are here talking about so-called extended simple. What are extended symbols, if there are any such things? Um, extended symbols are things that are simple, so lack any proper part, but are also extended. That means that they are exactly located at extended regions of a dimension. Okay? Now, um, we claim Ego's definition makes extended symbols impossible. Consider again an entity, circle, and now suppose that that entity is an extended symbol. So far we have uh, supposed that it was composed, now suppose it is an extended symbol. Okay? Now remember that an exact location of X is a region that both contains and is filled by X as long as no proper subregion of it contains and is filled by X. I am now going to show you that any subregion of R is such that it fills and contains X. And so R is not going to be possibly an exact location for it. Okay? Once again, have a look back at containment. Each part of X, so the question is whether a circle, as I said, is contained in R1. Well, intuitively not, it is not contained. But we should look at the official definition of contained, right? And we, in fact, verify that each part of X is weakly located at the subregion of R1. Why? Well, remember that circle is an extended symbol. So, when we say each part of X, we are referring to only X itself. Is X weakly located at a subregion of R1? Well, obviously, yes. Why? Because R1, or any subregion of R1, is not completely free of X. So, 
X is going to be contained in R1. And what about filling? Well, X is weakly located at each subregion of R1. Right? Take any subregion of R1. Um, that subregion is not going to be completely free of X. So once again, X fills R1. We have just, just shown that X fills and is contained uh, in R1. But if this is the case, then there is a proper subregion of R which contains and is filled by X. So R, which was supposed to be the exact location of circle, cannot be an exact location of circle if we accept equals definition. It is probably worse than that, of course, because this was a random region and uh, this trick works for any random extended region that is a subregion of R. Okay? So this means that basically that cannot be extended simples because with any extended simple you're gonna have this problem. So equals definition makes extended simples impossible. So to sum up, it seems that we are back to our dilemma. If we define a weak location in terms of exact location, exactness follows, which is bad. If we take both as primitive notions, plausible principles become brute necessities, which is bad again. If we define exact location in terms of weak location, then either we follow Parsons and multi-location becomes impossible, or we follow Eagle and in interesting cases, multi-location become impossible. So it seems that we are indeed back to our trilemma. Eagle's definition does not give us a viable way out from this dilemma. So right now, Claudia and myself are in fact working on option B. So we know some people that are actually working <coughs> on uh, option C. So they are trying to come up with other definitions of exact location. Uh, we are actually working a little bit on option B, which was, uh, was uh, an option that was suggested by, I think, Gilmore in the first place. And we are trying to see whether it is possible to make uh, those brute necessities less bad as they actually appeared in the first place. However, we are still exploring uh, our strategy, the strategy that we have decided to follow. And as of yet, we, I think, are not sure whether in following this strategy we have actually solved the problem, or rather, if we have made it spreading dramatically to several other paper cases. Um, but given that we are not sure about that, I should probably refrain from telling you anything about this. <laughs> um, so I said that I fulfilled the, the first necessary condition, I satisfied the first necessary condition for a talk given at least partly by Claudio, which Cloud is a cause. I'm now going, well, maybe some of you know the other necessary condition. The talk <coughs> must contain at least a quote. <laughs> So I'm going to end with, with a quote. Um, the way out of the dilemma is still a don't wind me up. Don't keep me waiting here. And uh, Claudio tells me this is a quote from Abbey Road uh, by Lennon and McCartney, which Claudio tells me are famous composers of popular music. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.